Welcome to Preaching That Matters. A place you can find apostolic Pentecostal preaching. A place where all generations can be fed with the word of God. We hope you enjoy. We have heard from God through Brother Kilgore in our night service. God has taught to us. When we get united, then there's nothing can stop us because God is our leader. And when we become one in heart and spirit, oh, what God can do with Texas. This treasure we have in earthen vessels today. We have three lovely ladies, such beautiful women. And you don't know their story until they're going to tell you what this treasure in their earthen vessels has brought them through and has kept them. And today I pray that somewhere in this congregation somebody can draw strength from what they say and what they will tell you. Our first beautiful lady is Sister Jerry Easy from Wichita Falls. of the power may be of God and not of us. I have a treasure in this earthen vessel. From my earliest childhood, I was taught to trust in God. As a child, when I turned to my parents for guidance, they pointed me to Jesus. And 21 years ago, at the age of 16, right here on this campground, I gave my heart and my life to God in one of our Pentecostal youth camps. He baptized me with his spirit. I committed my life to him. At that time, I was assured that he would go with me, that he would never leave me nor forsake me, that he would go even to the end of the world. I began my Christian walk with the Lord by accepting all of his promises as my very own. And you know what? I've never been disappointed. He's never let me down. He's never failed me. In September of 1969, I walked through the valley of the shadow of death. And you know, he was right there with me. He didn't leave me, but he guided me right through that valley. After suffering for several months with severe headaches and loss of equilibrium and several, several other problems, well, I decided that maybe I needed to go be checked by a doctor and find out exactly what was wrong with me. I went to one doctor after another and they would all check me and say, doesn't seem to me that you even have a problem. And finally, in desperation, I wore glasses and I decided, well, maybe, maybe I just need to go have my glasses changed. And so I went to the optometrist and he, he checked me and he said, lady, you don't even need glasses, but you do have a problem. I said, I'm sorry that I, I can't help you but I have a friend who can. And so I went from there to the ophthalmologist and on to the neurologist and finally to the neurosurgeon. I checked into the hospital on September the 10th and after several days of testing and checking, well, the surgeon came to me and he informed me that I had a brain tumor. Well, I was so thrilled that they finally found what was wrong with me. I was, I was relieved, even though it was a brain tumor. He told me that it was in a very delicate place. It was a very large tumor about the size of a ripe olive. And he told me all the complications 
that they would have to take the nerve that control the left side of my face. I would never be able to hear again out of my left ear. I'm deaf to this day in my left ear because of that surgery. He said if I lived through the surgery that there was a possibility that I would be a vegetable, not be able to walk or talk for the rest of my life. Or, you know, my mind could be affected because any time the brain is touched, there's always the possibility of brain damage. But all the time he was telling me this, I could look at him with a smile on my face because, you see, I had a treasure in this earthen vessel. And I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that my God would not let me down. He made this body. He knew all about it, and so I just looked at him and smiled. He said, young lady, where is your husband? I'd like to talk to him. I don't think he thought I understood or comprehended what he was saying to me. But he found that my husband had the same treasure that sustained him during this time. Later that night, several people began to come in and visit with me after they found out what the problem was. And they came with sad looks on their faces, and some of them had tears in their eyes. And I just smiled through it all because I, I didn't think there was any real danger because my father was in charge, and he knows all things, and he was going to take care of it. So I didn't see any reason to really worry. But after everybody left me that night, I began to think, well, maybe, maybe I'm not thinking just right about this. Maybe I should worry, you know, just a little bit anyway. And then I began to think about my father. And I turned over in the bed. The lights were all out, but sleep just didn't seem to come to me. And so I turned over and I closed my eyes and I prayed just a real simple little prayer that gave me peace and strength to sustain me during the next month. I said, Lord, I'm your child. And you know where I am right now. And you know what's wrong with me. Now, Lord, if, if you want to take me right now, that's fine. I only ask one thing of you, and that, Lord, I want to be ready. I want my heart here before you, because I want to meet you in peace. But, Lord, if it's not your will to take me right now, then you know, Lord, that I have two children that need a mother. And my husband needs me in his work. So, Lord, if, if you don't see fit to take me right now, then let everything be okay. Let me be where I can take care of my family and work for you. And, you know, something came into that room. A peace flooded my soul like I've never felt before. And I went to sleep and I slept like a baby. And during the days that followed, that peace didn't leave me. Because you see, I had a treasure in this earthen vessel. That great strength stayed with me. And it was not something that I had done, but it was from another source. It was from this treasure. Surgery was scheduled, and the day before surgery, they took me down and shaved my head, and that was one of the worst things that I went through, I suppose, because when they came in to cut my hair, my mother and sister was there, and we all cried because my hair was my glory, and it hurt me to see them take it away. But they shaved my head and they drilled a hole in the top of it to control some of the pressure. And then they, the next day I was going down to surgery. As I left my room early that morning, 
one of the little nurses who had been taking care of me, she came by and with tears in her eyes, she said, bye. And you could tell by the way she said it that she never expected to see me alive again. She just thought, well, that's it. I've seen her the last time. But I smiled at her and I assured her that everything was going to be okay. I'll see you later. And sure enough, I did. God was with me. Before surgery, they did one final test. They took 10 cc's of fluid out of my spine and put that much air in, and then they turned me upside down, stood me on my head, and that little air bubble kind of encased the brain tumor, and they took more x-rays. I thought they took quite a, a long time with that, but at that point, it didn't matter. I was ready for surgery, and so after being in surgery for about six hours, the doctors told me, said, okay, Rafi, we're all through now. You can wake up. And I said, okay, I'm cold. I want a blanket. Well, needless to say, everybody in the operating room was thoroughly amazed because, you see, I wasn't even supposed to be able to talk, much less have any presence of mind to know that I was cold. But this treasure that I had, remember, they didn't know about it. The doctor came and he told my husband that it was a very large tumor indeed. Remember he told me it was about the size of a rice olive? Well, it turned out to be the size of a very large lemon, which is quite a bit of difference. It was located underneath the cerebellum and they had to lift my brain to get to the tumor. After a while in recovery, they put me in the IC unit and told my family that they could come visit with me, but they warned them ahead of time, said, now, you know, she, she really looks bad, and, and I did, and she probably won't know any of you, so they just wanted them to be aware that there would be some change. Anytime the brain has been touched, they say that there is brain damage, and some people think that there is, but I know better. <laughs> So that's why they wanted to warn my family ahead of time. But do you know, as each of them walked into the ICU unit, I could see them as they came in the door, and I recognized each of them. I talked to them. I even told my husband uh, several people that had asked me to let them know. I remembered them asking him, said, let me know as soon as everything's okay. And I said, now, honey, you need to call so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so. And he said, well, where is their phone numbers? And so I just told him what they were from memory. I wasn't supposed to remember. But the Lord was with me. The second day I was in the ICU unit, um, it got kind of boring because I was the only one out of a dozen or so patients that was even rational. We had all had the same surgery. The rest of them didn't even know where they were, much less their name or what day of the week it was, but I knew everything. Hallelujah. I never did forget a thing. The Lord was right there with me. I sat up in bed on the second day. I knew all the nurses by name. They were just amazed. They couldn't believe it. And I was sitting up in bed, and, and the, the head nurse in the ICU unit was sitting right across from me, and she kept working, and she'd look up out of the corner of her eye every few minutes because this treasure that I had in this earthen, earthen vessel needed a little expression. And so I began to sing. And she thought, she's crazy for sure. But all I was doing was just talking to my Lord. I sat up in bed and I sang, Hold me fast, let me stand. In the hollow of thy hand, keep me safe till the storm passes by. And he did that. Before my family came to see me on Saturday, only three days after surgery, well, the, the chaplain in the hospital came to them and he warned them. He said, now, on the third day after surgery, the brain always swells and, and uh, she'll really be bad this morning. So I just want to warn you ahead of time. 
that that that's the usual case. But they had already decided that I was not the usual patient. And on the third day, they moved me out of intensive care to a private room. And remember, I wasn't supposed to be able to walk. But when they brought the wheelchair in to move me, I said, let me see if I can walk to the wheelchair. And they said, okay. I got up out of bed, and I walked to that wheelchair. Only three days after surgery. Praise the Lord. Because of the facial paralysis, the doctors decided that they needed to do a nerve transplant. And so 12 days after they had removed the tumor, they took me back to surgery. And they took a nerve out of my tongue and transplanted it behind my ear because my eye wouldn't close and I had no tears to that eye. And they did this to help me. And the doctor said, now, we know that she talked before, and we said she wouldn't, but uh, this time, when we take this nerve out of her tongue, um, half of her tongue will be paralyzed, and half of her throat, said she won't talk for a while. And she can learn to talk again, but um, she'll always, you know, not talk plain. She'll have a, a little problem from this point on. After about six hours in surgery again, when they brought me out of surgery, I was talking to them. In fact, they tried to take me back into the intensive care unit, and I said, no, I don't belong in there. And the head nurse came over, and she looked at my name on my bed, and she said, no, she doesn't belong in here. Take her on to her room. <laughs> and the next morning, very early the next morning, they had the IVs out, and I was sitting up in bed, eating breakfast on my own, and talking on the telephone. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> and by November, only two months after the first surgery, I was out of the hospital, taking care of my family, taking care of my own house, doing my own grocery shopping, driving, doing everything that I needed to do all on my own, without help, just like Jesus. Why was this possible? It's because of this Savior that I have. Like Sister Stanley said, there's whatever you need is in this Savior, and each of us has it. There was healing there when I needed it. When I entered the hospital, people all over the United States, probably some of you sitting right out there now, pray for me, and I thank you for it. It was because of this that I was able to recuperate like I did and come through this with such flying colors, not on my own merit, but because of this treasure that I have in this earthen vessel. I could face all of this with a smile and a song in my heart because I had a treasure in this earthen vessel. When I walked through the valley of the shadow of death, he was right there beside me. And you know what? I was not afraid because he was with me. You know, God has two ways of dealing with the storms in our life. He can either calm the storm or keep us safe through the storm. That's what he did for me. He kept me safe until the storm passed by, and I thank him for it. Don't you love this Jesus that we serve today? Oh, I praise him for his goodness. You have just heard what this treasure in your earthen vessel will keep you in fitness. And now we'll hear from another beautiful lady, Sister David Meyer. Praise the Lord, everybody. We become so adjusted to seeing the vessel that at times we forget about the treasure that's deep inside all of us. Sometimes after our vessel is broken, and we're viewing the remains in dismay that we noticed that there had been a treasure inside all along. But we never really realized how great a treasure it was 
until our vessel was broken, and then we saw. I received the Holy Ghost when I was only seven years old. In fact, it's even hard for me to realize what it was like to not have the Holy Ghost. And I'm thankful that the Lord gave it to me at such a young age. But many times when we receive the Holy Ghost at a young age, we take it for granted and we don't really realize how great that it really is. I always knew that it was something that I had to have when I died because it was my only hope of heaven. And I knew that I had to keep it deep down inside of me because I couldn't be caught and go to the judgment without the Holy Ghost within me. But it was after the Lord allowed my vessel to become broken that I realized I can't live without it. Not at all. It's something more than we have to have when we die. It's something that we have to have to live. In March of 1975, we were expecting a little baby to come to our house, and we were all excited. We were thrilled. Uh, my son Jason was excited about a new little brother and his sister that was coming. We had all the preparations made. I, the ladies of the church had given me a shower. I had my baby bed all fixed. The gowns and the booties were all folded and ready for him to come. And when about six weeks before my due date, it became evident that he was going to be born, I really wasn't very concerned. I just didn't feel like anything bad would happen when I had Jason. Everything just went real good. So I wasn't very concerned. And when he was born, the doctor said, well, he's pretty large for a premature baby. I don't think there'll be any problems. He weighed five pounds. And so they said, he'll, I'm sure will be all right, but we'll keep him here and won't let him come to your room for a while. So I really wasn't concerned. Uh, the doctor came in that evening to the hospital room, and he told my husband and I that uh, he was having a little breathing difficulties, but this was real normal for premature babies. And he was such a large child that he knew that he would make it. And so we uh, prayed about it, and we kept believing the Lord. But the next day, he wasn't better. He was worse. And they said, we really don't understand it, but we're sure that he'll be okay. Later that next day, they allowed me to go down to the nursery, and I went down there, and when I saw the little kids heaving in and out, gasping for breath, I knew that he wouldn't make it. And I looked up, and the nurse had big tears in her eyes coming down her cheeks, and I thought, my world is shattered. What am I going to do? I can't believe that it's happening to me. Later in the night, they came in, and they told us that he had passed away, and we couldn't hardly believe it, that it was really happening. I came home from the hospital and my mother had taken the baby bed down so I wouldn't have to look at it empty. There was all the church ladies there. They had prepared a beautiful meal for us. There my husband was. He was crushed also, but yet he was trying to comfort me because he knew that I had prepared myself for this baby so much and yet I didn't have it. But yet something within inside of me was hurting that no one could help but God. And God began to speak to my heart and tell me if I would just trust him a little while, I would see that good would come from this and that it would, I would understand it better later. But I kept pushing those thoughts aside. I wasn't real submissive to those things. I became real confused whenever I would hear a sermon on healing or on the widow's son being raised. It would confuse me and something would just tear at the inside of me. Whenever a child would be brought up for my husband to pray for and the Lord was healing, that old confusion would come back in me. I was fighting the treasure that was trying to comfort my soul. I went to camp meeting that next year, and I was especially depressed. It seemed everywhere I looked, there were babies, and I had looked forward to bringing mine. And that day, uh, that evening, as we were leaving the camp, Grand Brother Wayne McLean came up to us, and he said, Brother and Sister Meyer, the Lord has showed me something about y'all. He has shown me that you're going to have another child and that it's going to be all right. And then he added, he said, that doesn't mean that there won't be complications, but it does mean that the child will be all right. And I was so uplifted. It did something for me that nothing had been able to do for me since that I had lost Jonathan. So we became very excited. Several months passed, and finally the doctor told us that we would have another child around Christmas time. 
So I began to look in baby uh, books for names to name this child. I was looking through the book. I ran across the name Jonathan that we had named our baby that had died. And the meaning of it was given of God. And something happened inside of me. I thought, dear God, you allowed me to name that child. I just thought it was a pretty name. But you allowed me to name that child that because you actually did give me that child for a purpose. And it was a strength to me. I looked on down the list and I came to the name Justin. And it means God is just. And a peace began to flood in my soul. I thought, oh God, if you'll only give me another child, another little boy, I'll name him Justin because I know that you will have dealt justly with me. And so when it became closer to the time for him to be born, I became very anxious again. But this time, nine weeks before his due date, the doctor told us that he could do nothing to keep him from being born early. Naturally, I was very disturbed because it had happened once before that I had lost him. I expected to lose him. The promise of God was still in my heart and in the back of my mind, and I knew that I had planned to name this child Justin, that God is just. And I began those old confusing feelings became all, all over me like a black cloud. And I thought, how will I ever keep my faith when this child dies? Here I've trusted your promise. Here I've named, or uh, I'm going to name this child Justin because you are just to me. And I became very disturbed. But after he was born, the doctor told me, he said it'll be about 24 hours before that he develops any uh, breathing problems. But uh, we need to make preparations to transfer him to a Houston hospital before he gets so bad. So I had just gotten back to my room when the doctor came in and they said, we're sorry, but he's already developed the problem. And there's no use to send him to Houston. It would be so expensive and it would not be worth it because there's no way that he can survive. He will definitely die within just a few hours. So we pondered it over in our hearts, and I said, I don't feel like that I can leave him here. I want to send him to Houston. And so they transferred him by helicopter to Houston that day. When the helicopter left, I felt like he was gone, but yet I felt like I couldn't go with him, but God had. And I felt like God was going to intervene some way or somehow. So they took him to Houston, and they worked with him a few days. And then they too began to feel like that there was no hope whatsoever. They called my husband and I into the office one day and they said, we need to talk with you. We feel like you don't really realize how serious that your child is. He is the most critical child in the whole intensive care unit of Texas Children's Hospital. And we know that you've lost a child and it's been very hard on you. So we want you to begin to consider taking a foster child into your home so that you can make plans to do something that will fill the vacancy when this child dies. But something just rose up in me when they told me that, and I felt like that, that I could not accept that, that I couldn't really believe that God was going to fail me, and yet the enemy kept telling me, yes, he'll really fail you this time. But God was with us, and he helped me to hold on to just a little spread of hope and so in a few days, they told us that he was so bad, they had been putting off heart surgery, hoping that he would gain some weight. And he was down to three pounds and one ounce, and they couldn't wait any longer. They said, it's extremely high risk, but we'll do it, and uh, it, it, it'll be worth it if, if he comes through, but we don't feel that he will. So that day, I felt like that I had to hear a word from the Lord or others. So my husband and I went to Brother and Sister McLean's home because he was the one that God had promised this child to. And I asked Brother McLean that day, I said, Brother McLean, do you still feel the assurance of the promise? Or were you just trying to help my feelings and say it's going to be all right to me that day? He said, no, Sister Ma, I have felt the assurance like I've never felt over anything in all of my life. So we got down to pray that day in their home and we prayed just a very few minutes and Brother McLean quit praying and he got up. He started rummaging through the drawers in his desk and I really wondered what he was doing. In a few minutes he came back and he said, the Lord reminded me of a letter that I had received while I was down praying just a few days ago. He said, it's from 
from a dear old friend of God that the Lord has used many, many times to give me a direction in things. And he said, in this letter, he told me that someone would come to me with a desperate need of healing within a few days. And I was to give them two scriptures. The first scripture was in Mark, the 16th chapter, and the 18th verse. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. And then he said the other scripture is in Hebrews, the second chapter, and the 18th verse. For in that he himself hath suffered, being tempted, he is able to secure those that are also tempted. I had in my suffering really been tempted to doubt God.
the brightening of an earthly vessel is not the end of heaven's praises. This is God. But I believe that every prayer that my father has prayed for his family is going to come home and be kind. Thank you. 